Hey folks, Mark Yerk is here coming to you from the ancient Agora of Izmir, Turkey. But you may remember it by its biblical name, Smyrna, one of the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. So stick around for this new episode of Obscure Christian History. Izmir is a modern city centered around the second largest port in Turkey, only surpassed by that of Istanbul. But Izmir is perhaps better situated, being directly on the Aegean coast. Smyrna was an important port of the Roman Empire, and it still has access to the Aegean Sea today, which cannot be said for most of the cities of ancient times whose harbors silted over over the period of time and were abandoned. Ephesus would be one example of that. Smyrna was actually founded in the third millennium BC as a city-state of the Ionian League. When Alexander the Great conquered the region, he turned it into a Greek city, and it remained so until absorbed into the Roman Empire and the later Byzantine and Ottoman Empires. Its name was not changed to Izmir until 1930, after the establishment of the Republic of Turkey. But our goal is to focus upon the city's Christian history, and we find its first mention in the second chapter of the Holy Bible's Book of Revelation. Towards the end of the first century, Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God, had a message for all of his people. But he addressed this message, written by the hand of the Apostle John, to the seven key churches in Asia Minor, one of which was located in Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The message to the Christians of Smyrna was not difficult for them to understand. It was a more detailed reiteration of a truth that Jesus had taught during his earthly ministry. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The people of Smyrna were proud of the fact that their city had once been destroyed and been brought back to life, revived by Alexander the Great. And so Jesus picks up on that theme to put it into a spiritual perspective. The church in Smyrna had been persecuted. Many had lost their jobs, their money, and they were suffering slander at the hands of Jews from a synagogue, which Jesus refers to as a synagogue of Satan, not because they were worshiping Satan outright, but because they were doing the things that Satan desired, killing, stealing, lying, and destroying. They slandered the Christians, and that had an effect upon them. And they were about to face even more persecutions, but Jesus says not to worry and not to fear. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who died and has risen from the grave. That must have been a great satisfaction and a great comfort to these Christians. They were encouraged to remain faithful through suffering, even to the point of death if God so willed. Those who endured would not suffer spiritual death but would receive the crown of life. The Smyrna church did survive this period of persecution. But decades later, 
persecution, like tidal waves crashing against the shore, once again arrived. This time directly from the Roman Empire. The Apostle John spent his final years, according to tradition, ministering in Ephesus. And part of his ministry, as defined by the Great Commission Jesus has given to all Christians, was to make disciples. We know that John did so because one of his most devout disciples was a man named Polycarp, who was not only trained, but ordained by John to become leader of the church in Smyrna. Polycarp was one of a small number of followers who had been directly discipled by the Twelve Apostles, and so they have been given the name Apostolic Fathers because they carried forward the teachings of the Apostles in their own writings. The letters of the Apostolic Fathers, including those of Polycarp, are essential to our understanding of early church history and the clarification of foundational doctrines. By the year 155, Polycarp was a well-respected elder bishop, known for his kindness and wisdom. But the Roman proconsul named Quadratus was determined to force Christians to reject Jesus and worship Caesar instead by offering sacrifice. Polycarp refused to do so. He was arrested and brought to trial. As in most Roman cities, criminal and civil matters were held sometimes at the theater, but more often at the judgment seat or bima, which was usually located near the agora. However, the remnants we see now in Izmir are not those of the agora that existed when Polycarp was brought to trial. An earthquake in 178 AD destroyed those structures. The current ruins are from the Agora rebuilt on the same location. Where I'm standing right now is the basement of the basilica. It was one of the largest basilicas of the ancient world here in the Agora. This was actually three stories high on top of this basement level. If you look at the columns outside, you'll have an idea of how tall it was. But the basement was an area where a lot of sales and other merchandise activities went on. And in the upper levels was more of the court system. There were so many legal cases, in fact, that there wasn't enough attorneys. So what they did was they put up statues of attorneys. Now, from what I know of the judicial system, the statues may have given a better defense than the live attorneys. I'm just guessing. Eighty and six years I have served my Lord, and he has never done me any harm, but rather much good. How can I blaspheme my King and Savior? Polycarp clearly represented himself, and no matter what threats were made, he stood firm in his faith and freely confessed that he was a Christian, refusing to renounce Jesus. I shall cause you to be burnt to ashes. You threaten me with fire that burns but for an hour. And are yourself ignorant? of the everlasting fiery judgment that is prepared for the wicked. Why do you delay? Bring against me what you please. So be it! It is said that Polycarp's bold words stirred some towards repentance, but that did not dilute the rage of the crowd. He was condemned to be burned at the stake, but the flames did him no harm. The frustrated executioner then stabbed him with a dagger, and thus Polycarp entered the presence of his lord. 
the bishop was not the first to be martyred in Smyrna, but he was the most prominent due to his personal friendship with the Apostle John, his sound teachings and leadership over many decades, and the fact that the Christians who witnessed his martyrdom wrote a detailed account to the church in Philomelium, which was then circulated to other congregations. Many more believers would later suffer for Christ's name's sake, and their steadfastness may well have been bolstered by Polycarp, and others who left behind a testimony of perfect love, casting out fear. Few of us are called upon to die for our faith, but we are all called upon to surrender our lives for our faith. And we will face our own challenges. Will you stand as firmly when testing comes your way? I hope that all of us will. That we too, might receive the crown of life. Thank you for watching this video. Join us again for more obscure Christian history. And may God bless.